stay tuned for the Joan Quinn Profiles. Joan served the state of California as a member on the Arts Council and on the Film Commission. She was formerly on the Architectural Commission and fulfilled two terms on the Fine Arts Commission for the city of Beverly Hills. As an editor for Andy Warhol's Interview Magazine, Condé Nast Publications, and the Hearst Corporation, Joan covered the world of fashion, the mysteries of food, the excitement of theater, and the international art scene. She continues to find people who are on the cutting edge of their professions. Here's Joan Agajanian Quinn. Hi, I'm Joan Quinn, and welcome to the Joan Quinn Profiles. We're on location at the Hollywood Museum in the historic Max Factor building, and we're on Highland Avenue in the heart of Hollywood. Our guests are film director Darko Matrevsky and actress Charlene Woodard. Born in Macedonia, Darko Matrevsky, after graduating from uh, the, the, the film and TV directing part of the Faculty of Dramatic Arts, went on to direct, produce, and write in his native country. He made music videos, documentaries, and he directed a popular TV series. How hard was it to become a director in Macedonia? Well, like, well, like, I guess, like becoming a, a nuclear physician in, in Pakistan. <laughs> it's something, you know, it's a, it's a rare pro profession. That's why that, I'm asking. That uh, small countries usually don't need. Yes, because how would you find a career in film? Uh, well, I was very passionate about it. Uh -huh. When I think of it now, uh, that's the only thing I, I, <laughs> I know how to do <laughs> properly. <laughs> yeah. I'm useless for anything else. Um, no, I was really passionate. As, as a kid, I was dreaming of becoming a, a movie director one day. But no one in your Los family? An, no one, no one. I'm, my father was... Uh, he was a physician. My mother was a dentist. Oh. Uh, my sister studied pharmacy. My wife, she studied medicine. So um, you were an outcast. Um, I'm uh, <laughs> totally surrounded with white uniforms. Exactly. Um, yes, uh, and but I, I, my family supported me. Even though I remember my father told me, you know, uh, oh. you're gonna live on the edge. Your the rest of your life, it's going to be full of risks and not many benefits. And I said, well, I'm. That's you were that, that's the life <laughs> I would like to live, and uh, and he said, okay, we'll do everything we could to support you. What kind of hurdles did you have to go through? Did you you started with music videos, did you, or did you start with TV directing? TV directing, music videos, commercials, anything you documentaries. Could get? You know, you you don't have much choice when you live in in in, in a in a country the size of Vermont. Uh, and um, yeah, everything that that brought me some some money and an opportunity to to learn the to learn the trade, the rules of the trade, and to become a better director. What were the hurdles? Uh, Was it equipment? Did you have equipment problems? Was there film problems? Acting problems? Oh my God, everything. <laughs> <laughs> because you you, know, you did that TV series for a long yes. time. Scope. How do you say it? Dossier, dossier Skopje. Skopje. Yes. That's the... The, the, the um, capital of capital Macedonia. Of it was, it was a TV, TV series about the <coughs> unofficial history of, of my native town. Did you write it? Yes. Oh, you I did? always write. I oh, always you wrote, wrote it Not all? because I enjoy it, but, but because I, I, I just simply cannot find a writer that I like. So uh, somehow the sentences, the dialogues I would like to, to, to direct are always, the, yeah, you know, I know how to write them. So what, so, so was it a half hour series and you wrote it yes, weekly? Yes, like, like, like 10 episodes, uh, 10 one hour episodes and uh, then I had two to feature films, Goodbye 20th Century was my first, then Balkan Khan, it was oh, a Balkan big, Ken. big right. commercial success. Right. And then I decided that it's time for something for something else. What were the two subjects of the, the two that you just mentioned? Uh, Balkan Khan and... The first one was a fantasy film, the second one uh -huh. was, uh, uh, I would say, dark comedy. 
<laughs> and then the third one, the third half. The third half. What is what is symbolic? <laughs> <laughs> What's what? What do we call it? Oh, uh, the third half. Yeah, the third <laughs> half was supposed to be the second film. <laughs> oh, it was. Yeah, but I, I, I was and unlucky or or lucky enough to you know to wait for 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 it for a while, and in the meantime, I, I as I was growing up, I realized that I'm not ready for that film yet, and then and, and, and uh. it will take some time, not only to. To find the, the finances for for the film, but to find the proper cast, uh, crew, uh, locations, uh, you know, full Back support and forth. of the. You and were to, living and in Los Angeles yes, then. You for, moved to Los Angeles for six years. What brought you here? Well, that's where <laughs> the movies are. <laughs> I remember when I when I moved to LA, I felt like wow. I feel like a kid in a candy store. Oh, you really felt like. But yeah. did you? Were you getting work? Uh, not in the beginning. No, no, it was tough. Like, I, I, I remember for the first two years I was totally lost. My English was real bad. And, and, so and it was very my, gutsy. my, my phone book, my, 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 my contact list on, on my iPhone was empty. <laughs> <laughs> so it was very gutsy. You were on the edge, as your father said. You I started, was. Yeah. I was. So, t so let's find out why did it take so long for the third half. Tell us what this third half means. What does the title mean? Well, there is no such, it's a soccer film, and there is no such thing as, as the, the third half I know. In, in, in the soccer business. There is a first half, then the half time, then the second half. The third half is, well, I'm not sure how, how I don't want to give any spoilers to the audience, especially since we plan to release it after, in next year, but uh, uh, the secret about the third half is uh, it's a love story of a young, beautiful Jewish girl from a wealthy family who eloped with a poor soccer player of another religion. He was, uh, she was Jewish, he was Christian Orthodox, and uh, later on that, wa that saved her life because her family renounced her because they, they didn't approve of that relationship. But later on, when the Nazis deported her family to the concentration camps, her name was not on those deportation lists. So the third half is the rest of her life. The rest of her life. Exactly. Because there's no third half in anything. You just no, said in no, soccer, but no. not in anything. But in her life, it is actually. Because you look through at that it. forbidden love, her bloodline survived. Right. So, so she was the, the real winner of that game against the Nazism. So she was. So she was holding the, the banner up <laughs> and saying, I'm the winner. Why did you have to make that? Because I know you were passionate and you had to make it. Well, it's about uh, it's about Holocaust. It's about soccer. It's about love stories. Right. Now, it I I am on an emotional level. I'm very related to, to all three of them because my grandfather was a soccer player before uh, the war, uh, uh. Uh, and he was always ashamed of his grandson. I'm so not talented for soccer, man, <laughs> unbelievably, and he was very passionate about it. But that's not the only thing about my grandfather. Um, during the war, he was sent to to uh, concentration camp, and he survived it. He is a Holocaust survivor. He's not Jewish. He was sent for a very bizarre reason. Uh, he was listening to to the radio London to Winston Churchill's speeches. And in Macedonia, it was uh, banned. It, absolutely, it was under uh, Nazi occupation, oh, and uh, and uh, they sent him to Gest first to the prisons of Gestapo the secret Nazi police, and then from there to a concentration camp. And I remember, I, I still have a very vivid memory of him telling me those stories, and I remember that was the first horrible experience oh, I ever had as a child. I mean, the first feeling of pure, essential horror. Not like watching Dracula or Frankenstein, right. but like knowing that something so terrible happened to someone, to old granddaddy that, that, that you know, and the, to the cutest man in the world. <laughs> that was real scary. But he survived. He survived. He survived. Thank God. Yeah. You showed this film at the Museum of Tolerance, and I know the, the Jewish Holocaust survivors were praising you for um, making a film that showed their side of the story, even though you did it f from a Christian point of view or orthodox point of view. Well, the Holocaust has no, I think, 
evil is evil. It has That's no point of view, you know. Very good. Uh, uh, out of six million Jews, out of eleven million people who who who, who eleven million Holocaust victims, six million were Jewish of Jewish origin, but the other, f the rest of them, the other five million people were uh, Soviet prisoners, oh, uh, uh, homosexuals, uh, oh, Jehovah my. Witnesses, uh, political opponents. Many of them were Germans, social democrats, we socialists. We don't really, really know no. that, do we? They don't really talk about that so much. We have no idea how many Germans had ended up in those concentration Very camps. Very interesting. So uh, Nazism, Nazism was against the Jews in the first place. But then Hitler's plans was to, he, to, to, to his ethnic cleansing right. was of such a terrible proportion. His idea was to, next were Poles on his schedule, oh, and then right. Czechs and Russians, and he he wanted to, to really. Um, Clean. Cle clean. Ethnically, <laughs> ethnically clean, clean yeah. half of Europe. So how did you cast this film? You had a, a woman, a beautiful woman, who'd never been on the screen before, you said. Yes. <laughs> uh, she's, a, she's a top model from New York. Uh, she lives in New York. She works all, all over <laughs> the world. And she's of Macedonian origin. I thought that it should be someone who is fresh who is a newcomer, who is a new face, really. Uh, and I, I, I needed some pure, clean material. And you no did. No previous <laughs> experience, experiences. You had it. And she was so sincere in her approach. She was so open-minded. She, she, she got used to the cameras. I mean, she's a top model. Right. Working for, since she was her, since her 16, uh, and now she's 24, uh, so she, she doesn't have any 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 fear of of the lances. But she could act. She, she could, could act. That was the thing. A model sometimes can't act. I, I was I was in in Macedonia and she was in New York and we met on Skype and oh. that was our first encounter. <laughs> and I remember giving her acting lens, lessons Did <laughs> over you, Skype like, online her? for a month. Oh. And, and 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 that was that was her 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 first acting lessons and I realized wow she's intelligent. She and can do it. a girl need to be intelligent in order to act. Good and actors need to be intelligent. But but casting her father, you didn't have to teach him how to act. Oh no, <laughs> <laughs> Radha Sherbegia, uh, the best, well, the the best. I, mean, I I believe he's the most successful and most famous actor from that part of the world. And he was fantastic in your in your movie. And he spoke a different language. Uh, he spoke his his native tongue. Native tongue is Serbo-Croatian, mm -hmm. and in this film he spoke none of them. <laughs> so I know. neither Croatian or Serbian. He spoke uh, Macedonian uh, oh, and Ladino. Ladino, Ladino was a, was the language of the Macedonian Sephardic Jews. You could hear a little bit of the Spanish come through. I could hear some words every now and then. How did you direct? In what language? Easily. <laughs> in English or in...? Uh, well, it, it depends. Um, we, we had such an international crew. My cinematographer was Austrian. Half of the crew were Macedonians. The other half were from Czech Republic. I had some <laughs> Croats. Uh, then my, my first assistant director was Serbian. One of the main actors, he's German. Bulgarian? Um, I, I forgot to mention Bulgarian, Bulgarian. Of course. Did you have problems with Bulgaria, with the people in Bulgaria from this uh, film? No. no. When you say people, I... I mean, I'm, I'm, the government, let's say. Politicians. Politicians, politicians. yeah. We had some radical right-wing politicians who tried their best to you know, to prevent this this movie from being completed. That's what I was afraid. And uh, three members, three me members of the European Parliament, three Bulgarian members of the European Parliament signed a petition against this film. Oh. And, uh, signed it against your film? Against this film. And I was, I was fiercely attacked by their prime minister even uh, in one of his <laughs> interviews. And... Um, Listen, I was in my, one of my interviews, the one I gave for Euronews, I said, uh, I got nothing else to say, but they, they blame me for forging historical facts, that their army and oh, police right. didn't 
deport the Jews from Macedonia and Thrace to, to Treblinka concentration camp. Well, if you go to the, to, to the website of Yad Vashem Museum or United right. States Holocaust Museum in Washington and type in Macedonia, you will find identical, and I repeat, identical facts and information as presented in my film. So um, what they're doing is classical revisionism, which means Holocaust, denial of the Holocaust, right. which we, is forbidden in all, in, in, in all civilized countries in Europe. But we hear that all the time. And I'm so glad you made the film because it tells us what was going on. Well, we hear that all the time, but never within the European Union. This, is, this, is, this country is a member of, of oh, the European that. Union, which is like you know, the best the 21st century has to, to offer. And that should uh, worry all the rest of us. Well, we thank you. Thank you for, for inviting me. It's been thank a pleasure. Thank you. And, and don't go away because we'll be back with actress Charlene Woodward. Hi, I'm Joan Quinn, and welcome back to the Joan Quinn Profiles. We're here on location at the Hollywood Museum on Highland Boulevard. Actress, playwright, award winner, on many levels, Charlene Woodard trained at the Goodman School in Chicago and is a member of the Actors Studio. You've seen her in major motion pictures on the great stages across America, and in recurring TV roles like Law and Order and The Fresh Prince of Bel-Air. <laughs> she's a great star in many other series, and she's also a storyteller who's appeared in so solo, I like to say one woman, but solo shows, Neat, Pretty Fire, Real Life, and The Night Watcher. Before we get into anything else, how did you get to the Goodman Theater, which is so great? Well, I had a boyfriend who was at <laughs> University of Chicago. Oh. And he wanted me to come with him. And he says, why are you applying to, like, Juilliard? That's ridiculous. Oh. You should go to the Goodman School of Drama. I said, Harris, where is that? He said, in Chicago. And I went. It's I, fabulous, it's isn't it? It's fabulous. I did my three-hour audition and everything, and, and I went there. Do you think that changed your life from going from Juilliard to the Goodman? I tell him all the time that he changed my life. He did. Because, well, not the, or he of the school but. to Goodman, but the fact that he said, go to a school that's specifically tailored to what you are going to do for the rest of your life. Oh. You know what I mean? And I had made a choice. I knew what I was going to do. And I knew what, I just needed this, that curriculum, that total immersion in the arts. Well, you were from a, a Upstate New York. You're from uh, New Albany. Yorker. You're yes. from Albany. Mm -hmm. We're very upstate. Mm -hmm. Very nice capital, mm -hmm. right? Um, was there show business in your family? No show business in my family, but we were right up the road from Broadway. And I had an aunt. <laughs> kind of up the road. Right there, but up the road nonetheless. <laughs> so my aunt would take day trips to New York and oh, took me and oh. took me to things and turned me on to the city. It was my dream to oh. live and work. And in New York City, based on what my aunt exposed me to. And so you did have the influence. And were you taking singing lessons, acting lessons? When did you start uh, taking drama well, class? First of all, my grandmother um, tricked me into being an artist because when I was 12, she said, Before I die, I sure would love to hear one of my grands sing in the, in the junior oh. church choir. Oh, that's so, it. So, of course, I joined the choir thinking Grandmama was dying. Well, it made, it made me find my voice, the fact that I could sing. Okay. And, um, of course, Grandmama lived until I was like an old woman. So, so she saw you on the stage forever, right? Forever. <laughs> and then I had a mentor in 10th grade, John Veeley, who turned me, really ushered me into the theater with the, the works of William Shakespeare, uh, Tennessee Williams, the Greek tragedies. That's what I worked on in high school. One of the things you did, though, as a singer, was Ain't Misbehavin' on Broadway, in L.A. Did you take it on the road? Like I was in, on Broadway in Ain't Misbehavin'. And then I went to London for six months. Oh, because you Because while in drama school, <laughs> I wrote in my journal in, during a boring class, I will work in the West End very soon. And, and there I you did. were. And we were at Her Majesty's Theatre 
We won all the awards that you could win. <laughs> and so um, I've spent six months in London. That's so great. great. And then you learned a lot more. Oh, yes. Yes, you oh, did. Yes. And then I did San Francisco and, and L.A. for the Ain't Misbehaving, and that was it. That's enough. That was great, though. Mm -hmm. And were you dancing? dancing? Well, yeah, they made me do everything in that show. It was crazy. I danced uh, like with Andre De Shields. The oh, cast right, was amazing. Right. Andre De Shields, uh, Ken Page, Ramelia McQueen, Nell Carter. Oh, well, you had all the greats. They were something else, and they did crack that whip, and I grew. And you were a little girl. Why did you decide then, from this fabulous ensemble of actors, um, to do these one-woman plays? Well, all my life, I've seen myself as an actor. And after Ain't Misbehaving, I spent years going from musical to musical you, to musical. Oh, you did musical. And yeah. I wanted to work with just words on the stage. Uh -huh. And I realized that if I wanted to work with words, I had to prove to people that I could handle words, that I was an actor. Um, I became a member of the studio, uh, I, I became involved with the actor studio, and I was doing my best work in classes. So, um, and I had been or, or originating all this work in New York City. So when the opportunity presented itself, there I was. So Does it change? No, it doesn't change, although I do use my audience. I was going to ask I use about my that. audience so that, you know, a moment last night that we laughed at might choke me up tonight. Oh. I allow for all surprises. I love to surprise myself. And then what happens with your script? No, you the lines want? don't change. Oh, That's the lines. point. I love the discipline of the actor. I, see, I, see. I want the discipline of having these lines remain. That you wrote and that you know what to say. You, you um, did this at Seattle, right? Did um, you start all of my night plays, watching? except for The Pretty Fire, have started at Seattle because of my relationship with Daniel Sullivan, who actually made me write the second play, which was a part of their new playwrights uh, workshop series. After that, I developed quite a few there. I've developed them at Sundance Theater Lab. I've developed them at, oh, Oh Hi Playwright. I was going to say, Oh Hi. Is that and also this Night Watcher was really uh, also developed at the um, Page the Stage at La Jolla Playhouse. That's that three-week right. workshop with set, with costumes and everything. So it started, I mean, it, started it was starting. Right. It was and starting and starting and, and starting. And they oh, made me write it. Oh, they, oh, they did. did. Catherine Kemmel Kim called me up and said, Charlene, what do you have for us this year? I said, I have nothing. She says, I'll call you back in five weeks. Get something. Five weeks later, <laughs> she says, what do you have? I said, okay, give me two more days. Okay. And I sent it in, and they brought it in. We workshopped it, and it let me know I had a play. So, so tell us what the story is. Really, the story is about a woman with no children uh, who has about 43 of them in her life. I'm the, the godmother of 13 kids. Oh, they come and go. You I'm the, 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 the auntie of 23. And I have had a con contact with these children since I, they were babies. They first think I'm a play date. And then they realize, oh, she's the keeper of our secrets. And in oh. the play, they contact me with their secrets that are usually, I chose not the happy-go-lucky, fierce kids that are on it, on it, on it, but the ones that call with the problems. And then I get in there, and I do the best I can to help them. Did any of this actually happen? All of it actually happened. It, happened. it actually did, yeah. so you were writing it from... Fictionalized things to protect my kids. Right. But all of it, all of it actually happened. And, um, you know... I'm, I, I'm, I, I realize there's, there's another way to have children. You don't have to physically have children to have children in your life, have them bless your life, have them help you grow. Because when I get in there to help them, they have no idea how gratifying it is and how they're helping me. Did all the other plays have this kind of emotional draw to them? Absolutely. And, uh, yeah, well, you know, my play, my plays, are they the things I want to do on the American stage? I put them into my play. You know, I'm not shucking and oh, jiving. I see. You know, I want I, I you know, and every time I write a play and do it, 
I get more work in New York City, <laughs> off Broadway. You know, uh, people do hire me to do their own, their plays, and I love doing other people's work. But is it because of African American? All my plays have been offered to me because I have a body of work that everyone knows about in New York City, and they just say, okay, she's been doing this for enough time, let's give it to her. Right, but, um, the, but we're talking about great African-American writers. But it also, The Witch of Edmonton, which I just got my latest O before, it's a, it's, a, it's a play that was written back in Shakespeare's day. It's all iambic pentameter. Oh, wow. And I just, you know, and she was 80 years old, and I just did that. So and I do everything. I go down, I do work at Shakespeare Company at oh, Theater of yeah. Washington, D.C. And um, I am, because of my solo work, that jump started it. Oh, I but I get to do all the stuff I dreamt of doing when my grandmother first put me on a stage. Okay, before we leave, can somebody else play those roles? in the your glorious <laughs> part of it. Women all over the country are doing my play. They are. That's what I wanted to On know. On college campuses, they do Pretty Fire with five women, multicultural, because it's five separate stories with oh. beginning, middle, and Is end. that right? Oh, yes. Flight is being done right now. My multi-character my, my multi play, uh, I adapted African and African-American folk tales. That's being done right now in Indi Indiana. And um, uh, oh. someone just finished doing The Night Watcher. I so you're not like ego driven that you have to be the person in this you thing. Know what I love I love that I have created work for other other women. That's what I thought was so fantastic because a woman on stage alone talking about women's problems and issues. Well, they're not all they're not the stories are not all about women's problems and issues because you know I've added in my husband oh, good. and then people see them Well, that's, that's a woman's issue. Uh, well, <laughs> And so it is. And so it is, Joe. So we're happy that he's added in. Yes, yes. <laughs> thank you for being here. And thank you for watching the Joan Quinn Profiles.